please open up your Bibles to the book of 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 1. That's not a joke. We're, we're going to look at 1 Timothy to start. <laughs> I saw some, some smirks there. We're still in the 66 book series. Fear not. But we're going to start here tonight in 1 Ch- Timothy chapter 1. Because Paul, dealing with a group of men in Ephesus, even as he writes to young Timothy, is tackling an issue that intersects very much with what will be tonight. But I want us to just direct our attention to 1 Timothy 1, starting at verse 3, reading from the Legacy Standard Bible. Paul writes, As I exhorted you when going... To Macedonia, remain on at Ephesus, so that you may command certain men, certain ones, not to teach a different doctrine, nor to pay attention to myths and endless genealogies, which give rise to mere speculation rather than furthering the stewardship from God, which is by faith. But the goal of our command is love from a pure heart and a good conscience and an unhypocritical or sincere faith. For some straying from these things have turned aside to fruitless discussion, wanting to be teachers of the law, even though they do not understand either what they are saying or the matters about which they make confident assertions. There were certain men in Ephesus who were practicing reading in the white spaces in the Old Testament. Paul says that He left Timothy and left him with an exhortation so that as Paul is going away, Timothy had these words ringing in his ears, stop those men from teaching that doctrine. He said he commanded or exhorted Timothy to command certain ones not to teach strange doctrine, or the the better translation that I think the LSB picks up here is merely different doctrine. It was heterodox, different teaching. Stop teaching other stuff, and then verse 4, stop paying attention to myths and endless genealogies. They were giving themselves their attention rather than the clear unambiguous text of scripture to myths. These were fables, made up stories, and genealogies that were endless. They had no parameters, no borders, no limitation to them. This is what they were giving their attention to. Paul says, Timothy, tell them to stop it. And this is even instructive for all of us. Don't give your attention to things not demonstrable from the biblical text. Why? He tells us here, because they're giving their attention to this rather than giving their attention to the stewardship which is from God, which is by faith. A stewardship from God by faith. In other words, those who believe by faith, those who believe God has tasked them with a stewardship, something that they must be all about. In other words, the Christian life is all about one thing, and instead of being about that in their teaching, they have given themselves to something that is producing something else, not the stewardship which is from God by faith, but speculation. Their teaching gave rise to speculation. Paul says, in contrast to to that speculation that their teaching produces, right? The, The guy stands up on a Sunday in a small group, for example, and everyone's left speculating as a result of the teaching. That is fruitless. That is useless. And you probably know some people like that. They like to play with doctrine to talk about not what the text clearly says, but things that are hardly, if at all, provable from what the Bible says. They like to play in the white space with theological ideas. 
that leaves you just wandering in uh, philosophical musings, like what Smed talked about this morning in Equipping Hour. It doesn't sanctify the life. It's not fruitful. In contrast, biblical instruction does something else. Paul says, verse 5, this is his goal. This is Timothy's goal. The goal of our instruction is simply love, not speculation, love. That is what God has given the people of God who believe God to be doing. This is what the Christian life is all about, love. The two greatest commandments boil down to love for God and for people. The Christian life is primarily about love, and not just any kind of love, but love that, according to verse 5, issues from three departure points, a pure heart, a good conscience, and a sincere or unhypocritical faith. In other words, the, the life of the hearers of God's word must be sanctified so that from that sanctified inner life, heart, conscience, faith, they can be better lovers of God and others. Why is this so important for us to remember tonight, even as we consider the false uh, teachers, the, the ones who are teaching error in Ephesus? There's still some hope for them, apparently. But this is important for us tonight as we turn our attention to the book of 1 Chronicles, because it says that these men were giving their attention to endless genealogies. Endless genealogies. He says in verse 7 that they were wanting to be teachers of the law. Teachers of the law. They didn't know what they were talking about, even though they were confident in their instruction. You can find genealogies all throughout the scriptures. You have just in Genesis alone, Cain's genealogy in Genesis 4. Adam's genealogy in Genesis 5, Noah's genealogy in Genesis 10, Shem's genealogy in Genesis 11, Ishmael's genealogy in Genesis 25, Genesis 36, Esau's genealogy, and then chapter 46, you have Israel or Jacob's genealogy. And then from, moving on from the book of Genesis, you have Exodus 6 gives us a genealogy of Moses, Numbers 3, Ezra chapter 2, even the New Testament includes these, Matthew 1 and famously Luke 2 include Jesus' genealogy to prove in Matthew that he is the son of David with rightful inheritance or a rightful claim to the throne of David, and then in Luke 2, he is proven to be the son of Adam, a true man. All of those genealogies you'll know are not endless. They have limitations. They have a specific purpose in mind. But prominently above all of these genealogies, just by the sheer length, is the genealogical record in the book of First Chronicles a total of nine entire chapters. Nine chapters committed to telling us this person begat this person, and this person begat this person, and this person was the father of this one. Sometimes it's flipped. He was the son of this, son of this, son of this, son of this person. We get that for nine chapters. Still long, but it has limitations. And maybe you felt your own limitations as you tried to endure that in your reading plan. As we venture into this immensely important portion of Scripture, we would do well to heed these familiar words of Bishop J.C. Ryle. He says, think not for a moment that any part of this precious book, speaking of the Bible, is not profitable. Think not that such portions as catalogs and pedigrees as Leviticus and the description of Ezekiel's temp temple are useless and without value. Believe me, it is childish folly to question the usefulness of any word in the Bible merely because our eyes at present do not see its use. There is not a chapter or verse from first to last 
which is not in some way profitable. If you and I do not see its use, it is because we have not eyes to see it yet. But all we may rest assured is precious. All is very good. There is no sentence, no clause, no word, no syllable, no letter, but it is written for thy instruction. Every word of this precious book is intended to increase your love, Christian, love for God, love for the church, and love for others. And so tonight I want to attempt mostly from this genealogical record in First Chronicles to demonstrate the truth of that claim. I want to show you how the very purpose of the book of First Chronicles is discernible simply by a careful reading of the genealogies listed. So tonight, we are going to read every word in the nine chapters of these genealogies. I'm just kidding. We're not going to do that. But if, but if that brings you relief, I'll leave that between you and the Lord. <laughs> um, instead of giving you tonight my articulation of the purpose of the book up front, instead of starting with the purpose Um, I want to simply open up and show you what the prophet who authored the book under the guidance of the Holy Spirit chose to emphasize as the Spirit moved his pen. If we can discern what the human author is emphasizing in his writing and where he's going with what he emphasizes, then we can discover what God is intending through this and any other biblical book. Maybe you've attempted that. Maybe you've come to a a book and you've just wondered, what's the point of this book? Why is this in my Bible? Why did this person write it? It doesn't seem useful perhaps to me. Why is this here? And then to answer that question, you've run to your handy dandy John MacArthur study Bible. And those notes in the, in the beginning of the book, the historical notes and the way that John MacArthur has neatly uh, included the historical information and summarized the book, that is very useful. But you ever wonder, where is he getting that? How does he arrive at the meaning of, of a book or a particular passage? Well, the, the way that biblical scholars and the average Christian can arrive at God's intended meaning, the human author's intended meaning in a book is simply by letting the book speak for itself. It's all there. We just need to be careful readers, um, illuminated by the Holy Spirit to understand God's word as he intended. Like the book of Kings, the book of Chronicles was, was at first one single volume, and we do not know entirely who wrote the book of Chronicles. Uh, Historically, Jews have attributed authorship to Ezra. Just go to the end of the book of 1 Chronicles, chapter 36, 23. 2 Chronicles, excuse me, chapter 36. Verse 23. And just back up to 22. Now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, in order to complete the word of Yahweh by the mouth of Jeremiah, Yahweh stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, so that he had a proclamation pass through his kingdom and also put it in writing saying, thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, Yahweh, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth and he has appointed me to build him a house in Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Whoever there is among you of all his people May Yahweh his God be with him and let him go up. If you can even see Ezra on the other page in your Bible, 
Just notice how Ezra similarly starts with the same words. Now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, in order to complete the word of Yahweh from the mouth of Jeremiah, Yahweh stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, so that he made a proclamation pass throughout all his kingdom and also put it in writing saying, thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, Yahweh, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth and he has appointed me to build him a house in Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Whoever there is among you of all his people, may his God be with him. Let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and rebuild the house of Yahweh, the God of Israel. He is the God who is in Jerusalem. So the books similarly end and begin. And so knowing that Ezra wrote Ezra, historically, authorship of Second Chronicles has been attributed to that scribe, Ezra. So that's a, a part of just telling us where the author is heading in Chronicles. He's going all the way up to the point where the exile has ended. The exile's over. A pagan king acknowledges that God is the God of heaven, Israel's God, Yahweh, who brought them out of Egypt, who made a covenant with Israel specifically of all the nations of the world, who dwells in Jerusalem, wants his house rebuilt. The exile's over. He commissions them to build that God, Yahweh, a house in that land, in that city, a temple. That's where the book ends, the book of Chronicles. That's a part of us discerning the purpose behind the book just noticing where the author is going, the end of the exile. But go back to where it begins. Look at where this author chooses, of all the places that he could begin. He begins in 1 Chronicles 1.1. 1, 1. Adam, Seth, Enosh, Kenan, Mahalalel, Jared, Enoch, Methuselah, Lamech, Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. That's where he begins with Adam, and then he ends with the end of the exile. That's your first clue as to what the author is doing with this book. Whatever his purpose is, it has to do something with the beginning of man to the ending of exile. The beginning of man to the ending of exile. He's capturing all of that history in these pages, in this book of Chronicles. I think that where he's going is not awfully difficult to discern just within the gene genealogical record. He's showing us what he wants us to get even before we finish reading all of the genealogies. Um, if we were all Jews uh, receiving these words post-exile, as people have started to come back into the land, uh, the, the temple has likely been rebuilt at this time. There's a, a group of faithful people dwelling again in the land, in Jerusalem, where God's temple has been rebuilt and the law has been reinstated. Men like Ezra are teaching the people to adhere to God's word. And if we would have been a part of them receiving this word, then we would have had a unique place in God's redemptive history with a unique book to sort of hang all of our thoughts on, this would have made perfect sense to us what the author was driving at. In keeping with what we've already seen, the ending of exile, let me just show you a couple places in the genealogies where the exile is, is mentioned again and again. Go to chapter 5, verse 6. This is where the descendants of Reuben are being documented. 
And then chapter 5, verse 6, Bera, his son, whom Tiglath, Pilneser, king of Assyria, took away into exile. He was leader of the Reubenites. So here inserted in the midst of documenting the descendants of Reuben, Jacob's son, we get a mention of the exile. Again, in verse 26, he mentions regarding this uh, half tribe of Manasseh, but they acted unfaithfully against the God of their fathers and played the harlot after the gods of the peoples of the land whom God had destroyed before them. So the God of Israel stirred up the spirit of Pul, king of Assyria, even the spirit of Tiglath-Pilneser, king of Assyria, and he took them away into exile namely the Reubenites, the Gadites, and the half-tribe of Manasseh, and brought them to Hala, Habor, Hara, and to the river of Gazan to this day. And so dwelling in that portion of the land, on that side east of the Jordan, you you have the Reubenites, Gadites, and the half-tribe of Manasseh. Uh, talk uh, again, though, mention of the exile mentioned. So this is a theme that the writer has in mind is the exile, the beginning of the exile, as well as the end of it. Just look again at 8, verse 6, chapter 8, verse 6. Here, Benjamin, and especially King Saul, are in view. Chapter 8, verse 6, these are the sons of Ehud. These are the heads of the father's households of the inhabitants of Geba, and they took them away into exile to Manahath, namely Naaman, Ahijah, and Gera. He took them away into exile, and he became the father of Uzzah and Ahihud. So again, mention of the exile made. And then one more time, in the genealogies, chapter 9, verse 1. So all Israel was recorded by genealogies, and behold, they are written in the book of the kings of Israel. And Judah was taken away into exile to Babylon for their unfaithfulness. Notice in what we read, the exile is attributed to what specifically? The same word is used, unfaithfulness unfaithfulness. The exile was the result of God's people's unfaithfulness. Exile and unfaithfulness. This isn't the only repeating theme that we see happening in the genealogical record. Go back to chapter 2, verse 15. This is the dominant theme in the book of First Chronicles, chapter 2, verse 15. He arrives at this point, Ozem the sixth, David the seventh, talking about the sons of Jesse, the sons of Jesse. So in chapter 2, he's already at David. He is in a hurry to get to David. Look again at chapter 3, verse 1. Now these were the sons of David who were born to him in Hebron. The firstborn was Amnon by Ahinoam the Jezreelitess. The second was Daniel by Abigail the Carmelitess. And then he goes on documenting the third, fourth, fifth, sixth, etc., sons of David. Again, he's in a hurry to get to King David. Look again at chapter 4, verse 31. After documenting David's offspring in chapter 3, he begins with Judah in chapter 4, and lo and behold, ends right back up at David. Beth, Markaboth, Hazar, Susim, Beth, Biri, and Sha'araim, 
These were their cities until the reign of David. David stands here as a marker, David's reign. For even in the genealogical records, David bears a prominent place. His reign, the timing of his reign, stands as something of a time marker. These were their cities until the reign of David. Go to seven, chapter 7, verse 2. In the midst of Issachar, the tribe of Issachar, this genealogical record, he says, Now the sons of Issachar, Tola, Pua, Jashab, and Shimron, four, verse two, the sons of Tola were Uzi, Rephaiah, Jeriel, Jahamai, Ibsam, and Samuel, heads of their father's household. The sons of Tola were mighty men of valor in their generations. Their number in the days of David was 22,600. So somehow the importance of the warrior's number has to do with the days of David. He's making David again a reference point. So what's important to know about Issachar and the mighty men that were in Issachar is that they numbered a certain amount in David's day. David's important. He's fixated on David. And one more time in chapter 9, verse 22. Noting those exiles who returned. So he's documented the genealogy and he's mentioning now throughout Israel's history. Now we're up to the current day, so to speak close to the current day, those who have returned, verse 22, all these were chosen to be gatekeepers. These are the uh, ones of the Levites. At the threshold were 212. These were recorded by genealogy in their villages whom David and Samuel the seer established in their office of trust. So they and their sons were over the gates of the house of Yahweh, even the house of the tent of those who kept watch. And then it describes more about them uh, keeping the house of Yahweh and guarding the gates. But it mentions that it was in David's day that the genealogy was recorded in their villages. Um, they, David and Samuel would have been the ones uh, who participated in establishing these uh, Levites to their office. So here again, David bears a prominent place. And then you just read the rest of the book. Even if you scanned the book, there's even benefit in that, just a, a lesser version of reading, to just let your eyes fall on the, on the pages and flip the pages, uh, whether you're looking at your English translator's headings, or just scanning the words, you'll notice everything has reference in the book to David. Uh, Even David's mighty men are mentioned. Uh, What David does with the ark is mentioned, just highlights of David's reign as king, bringing the ark back into Jerusalem, uh, wanting to see the house for a house for God established, David, lengthy prayers that David gives, his plans to build the temple, uh, David's kingdom being firmly established, his victory over his enemies, his wars with the Philistines, his victories over Philistine giants, even his prominent uh, numbering of the people. David's sin with Bathsheba isn't detailed. That's sort of left out. But his other great sin that's documented in Samuel comes up here again in First Chronicles, I think probably because of the significance that it bears to future promises, because it was at that place where David stopped the judgment of God against his numbering of the people. That became the Temple Mount where he offered the sacrifice. So that has to get documented because of the prominent place that the temple holds. But everything, I mean, the the book essentially functions as something of uh, 
David's heroic feats, a, a, a record of David's greatness. This entire book. Uh, some other things just in reference to David that I want us to notice. Judah is, is prominently mentioned, again, with reference to David. It's because David is a member of this tribe. He's a descendant of Judah the man, a part of the tribe of Judah. So Judah gets to play a prominent role in the book, and Judah is exalted over every other tribe. The tribe of Judah is exalted over every other tribe, and Judah the man is exalted over his brothers. Just notice how this happens, how the tribe is exalted over Simeon in one place, chapter 4, verse 27. This is in the midst of talking about Simeon. So Simeon's descendants are here being chronicled. And here we have this inserted in the midst of the genealogical record. Verse 27 of chapter 4. Now Shimei had 16 sons and six daughters, but his brothers did not have many sons, nor did all their family multiply like the sons of Judah. It's kind of messed up. The comparison in the midst of, of Simeon's moment to be chronicled, and here Judah has to be inserted as having more sons. Their family didn't multiply like the sons of Judah. And then going on, they lived in at Beersheba and on and on. You know, this feels just odd to have inserted in the midst of a genealogical record. If you're just telling me who is the, who is the father of whom, why, why does that have to be compared with Judah? Why do you have to tell me that Simeon's didn't multiply like Judah's? You know, it feels like what happens with my kids sometimes when you're just telling, giving, giving instruction to one, son, you didn't put your shoes on like I told you to do. Put your, go put your shoes on. And then the other one, dad, I put my shoes on. Son, eat up. Hurry up so you can finish. I finished my food. I'm eating. I'm almost done. You know, why the comparison? That's not necessary. Well, for this author's purpose, it is necessary. What is he driving at? He's trying to exalt Judah, let his audience know Judah and David bear a prominent place exalted above all the rest. So you should be giving note to those details as you read through these genealogies. Even Judah the man is exalted over his brothers. Just notice in chapter 5, as Reuben's genealogy is given in chapter 5, look at verse 1. Now the sons of Reuben, the firstborn of Israel, for he was the firstborn, but because he profaned his father's bed, his birthright was given to the sons of Joseph, the son of Israel, so that he is not recorded in the genealogy according to his birthright. This is some explanation of Israel's history, and he's explaining why Reuben has the place that he has currently because of the man's sin. Joseph's sons, or Joseph, through Manasseh and Ephraim, if you remember in Genesis 48, Joseph gets the blessing through his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim, so that the birthright passes to those two instead of Reuben. And then in verse 2, we get this note about Judah. All of a sudden, Judah appears again. Though Judah prevailed over his brothers, and from him came the ruler, yet the birthright belonged to Joseph. So even, I mean, it's, the author can't even tell us that Reuben lost his birthright and it went to Joseph except to mention that the ruler came from Judah. He doesn't want us to be confused. The ruler doesn't come from Joseph. The ruler comes from Judah, David's king. The promise went to David and his seed. That's a part of his purpose in the book. And then lastly, not only the tribe of Judah and the man Judah, but the territory of Judah is even exalted. Look at chapter 6, verse 54 and 55. Judah's territory. You could go back and read this in the book of Joshua, 
the latter chapters of Joshua, this is recorded. And here again, it's repeated historically. Chapter 6, verse 54. Now these are their settlements according to their camps within their borders to the sons of Aaron of the families of the Kohathites, for the lot was theirs first. So what did Aaron get? What was his inheritance? Not entire territories, but just areas so that the Levites would be scattered throughout the land. Here's what they got, verse 55. To them they gave Hebron in the land of Judah with its pasture lands all around. But the fields of the city and its villages they gave to Caleb, the son of Jephunneh. So here the author wants you to know Aaron, the prominent place that the high priests got, where was it? In Judah's territory in Judah's territory. This tells us something as we're just finding what is the author after, again, the end of the exile, starting with the beginning of mankind, and between that time, David, from the tribe of Judah, Judah, the tribe, play a significant role in whatever God's doing. Even Judah's... uh, not only Judah the man, the tribe, the territory, but Judah's faithful descendants end up getting prominent space. Uh, We won't turn here, but chapter 2, Caleb, this faithful Judahite, gets lots of ink devoted to his descendants. Caleb, verses 18 through 55 in chapter 2, all documented to Caleb. Why Caleb? Of all the, the men of Judah... Why him? Well, he received specific territory, so that's important. But why Caleb? Because Caleb was the only, at one time in Israel's history, faithful man of Judah. And so he gets highlighted, a faithful man of Judah. Just as he's noting unfaithfulness is what got them removed, Here, one faithful man of Judah gets prominently highlighted. And then he not only appears in chapter 2, but in several other places, simply in the genealogical record. Tells us what our author's after. Let me show you one other example of a faithful Judahite. Chapter 4, you get two verses in chapter 4. In the midst of talking about Judah's descendants of another faithful Judahite named Jabez. Chapter 4, verse 9. Now Jabez was more honorable than his brothers, and his mother named him Jabez, saying, Because I bore him in pain. Then Jabez called on the God of Israel, saying, Oh, that you would bless me indeed and enlarge my border and that your hand might be with me and that you would keep me from harm that it may not pain me. And God brought about what he asked. Anybody remember the prayer of Jabez? That was like a thing for like two minutes a long time ago about how God wants you to prosper and have fullness in this life. Uh, All you have to do is ask and believe without doubting, and he would enlarge your territory. Just to point out the obvious, Jabez is concerned about actual land, right? Enlarge my border. This is not about self-actualization, the power of positive thinking, far from it. This is about a faithful descendant of Judah who is, notice in verse 9, more honorable than his brothers. Does that sound familiar? You you remember anything from the Old Testament where one brother was more honorable, more full of faith than all the rest? Joseph, perhaps. More faithful than his brothers. David, perhaps. More faithful than his brothers brothers, uh, the, the writer of Samuel, very specific, 
that Samuel went and looked at the first one. Nope, not the one. Second one, nope, not the one. Third, nope, not the one. Fourth, nope, all the way down to the last brother, David. David goes to his brothers. They don't believe Yahweh. They're scared with the rest of Israel. And they don't even have confidence in David who has faith in Yahweh. David was more honorable than his brothers. Here you have another man of Judah, more honorable than his brothers. And what does he do, this honorable man, verse 10? Well, he called on the name of the God of Israel. And he prays a prayer of faith. (laughs) Bless me and do what with this blessing? In your blessing me, do what? Enlarge my borders. Enlarge my borders and that your hand might be with me and that you would keep me from harm that it may not pain me. Um, Don't add any reproach with the promise, any reproach with the blessing. This sounds, even though I'm sure there's more here, this does sound like what God promised Abraham. Land, protection, that he would be uniquely with him, right? That your hand would be with me and grant him land. So here you have a faithful man of Judah standing above, distinct from unbelieving family that doesn't call on the name of the Lord, descended from Judah, going to God for a portion in the land, concerned about his inheritance in the land and God uniquely being with him. The author's doing something here. Why? Why two verses in the, just tell us that Jabez existed and move on. Nope. We have to stop to tell you that the other details matter. A faithful man of Judah, prominent among his unbelieving brothers, calling on the name of God, believing God for an inheritance in the land. This is all a part of this author's unique purpose. Just want to draw your attention for one moment to how, in contrast with David's prominence, Saul is ill-esteemed. Saul is ill-esteemed. Go to chapter 9. Saul's genealogy starts in verse 35. Um, or the, the family of Saul, he gets to Saul eventually in verse 39, but starts at 35 to, you know, focus on Saul. That's what's important about that lineage. But in this, Saul is actually ill-esteemed because where this is going is from chapter 9, verse 35, to talk about where Saul comes from, to then an entire chapter basically devoted to Saul's dishonorable death. Notes that he gets his head cut off, his head and his weapons get passed around by the enemy Philistines throughout their territory so that they gloat and boast in their victory over Israel. This is the author in one way of saying God's name was put to shame because of Saul. But just notice what he actually says about Saul and why this happened to Saul. Verse 13 in chapter 10. Thus Saul died for his what? What does it say? Unfaithfulness. Unfaithfulness. He won't let us lose sight of those who were unfaithful in contrast to those who were faithful. Saul died for his unfaithfulness, which he committed against Yahweh because of the word of Yahweh, which he did not keep. He did not keep Yahweh's word and also because he asked counsel of a medium, making inquiry of it and did not inquire of Yahweh. Therefore, he put him to death and turned the kingdom of the kingdom to David, the son of Jesse. There we go. Talking about David again. Because Saul was unfaithful. God's name was blasphemed among the Gentiles because of Saul. He does what? I'm going to give the kingdom, the kingdom to David, the son of Jesse. David is a better man. The kingdom is safer in the hands of David. 
in essence. Where's all of this going? Here's where all of this going. As he highlights David, Judah, faithfulness, the land. I'll just give you a few references. Jerusalem, the land is highlighted. Uh, Chapter 3, verse 5, chapter 6, verse 10, chapter 6, verse 32, chapter 8, verse 28, chapter 8, verse 32, chapter 9, verse 3, chapter 9, verse 34. Jerusalem is specifically mentioned. Again, all of this within the genealogies. He's not just telling you who came from whom, but he's noting Jerusalem's prominence in the midst of that. He mentions the land just in identifying various places. But then in chapter 6, verse 35 and following, the land is specifically honed in on. Chapter 16, verse 18. Chapter 7, verse 9. The land, the land, the land is mentioned. This is Canaan specifically in view. And then the last thing that, that I'll mention is the temple also bears a prominent place. Just if you were just noting what keeps coming up among all the differences, what's the same? You would also note that the temple is mentioned, where God dwells. The tabernacle at times, but then especially the temple. God's house, chapter 6, verse 10, chapter 6, verse 32, chapter 9, verse 2, and verse 11, and 13, and 26 and 27. Chapter 17, verses 1 and following, the temple is at length mentioned in the Levites' uh, respective to the temple. And then you get five chapters devoted to the temple and what happened in it. Chapters 22 all the way through 26. The book fixates on the Levites and what they did in the temple, that they were musicians, the furniture in the temple, the the singers and their rotations to serve in the temple. All of that's important for the audience that received this letter, and it's important for us all for the same purpose. So what's the purpose? What's the purpose of the book? Turn to chapter 17. Before summarizing the purpose, we have to get here. We have to get here, chapter 17, because the purpose of the book just prominently comes out of this moment in Israel's history. So we have a whole chapter devoted to it. Look at verse 1. Now it happened when David inhabited his house that David said to Nathan the prophet, Behold, I inhabit a house of cedar, but the ark of the covenant of Yahweh is under tent curtains. This is not right. So Nathan said to David, Do all that is in your heart, for God is with you. Now it happened in the same night that the word of God came to Nathan, saying, Go and say to David, my servant, thus says Yahweh, You shall not build me a house to inhabit. For I have not inhabited a house since the day that I brought up Israel to this day, but I have been from tent to tent and from one dwelling place to another. Wherever I have gone about with all Israel, did I speak a word with even one of the judges of Israel, whom I commanded to shepherd my people, saying, Why have you not built me a house of cedar? And the answer, of course, is no. God didn't instruct any of the rulers of his people to do this. This is David's idea. And good for David. It's a good idea. It's a right idea. That God would have a fixed place, a glorious place within his land. He said through Moses in Deuteronomy, I will appoint for myself a place. And he has not designated that place yet, even in David's day. David wants to give God a permanent dwelling place in the land. God said he, says he won't let David build it, though. But because of this God-glorifying pursuit that David desired, here's what God will do for David. Note verse 7. So now, 
Thus shall you say to my servant David, thus says Yahweh of hosts, I myself took you from the pasture, from following the sheep to be ruler over my people Israel. And I have been with you wherever you have gone and have cut off all your enemies from before you. And I will make you a name like the name of the great ones who are on the earth. This is the Davidic covenant and what comes with it. A great name. Verse 9, and I will appoint a place for my people Israel and will plant them that they may dwell in their own place. Don't they have their own place? Isn't David in the land already? Not like he means it here. Not yet. Because at that time, they will not be disturbed again. And the unrighteous will not waste them anymore as formerly, even from the day that I commanded judges to be over my people Israel, and I will subdue all your enemies. And I tell you that Yahweh, and I tell you that Yahweh will build a house for you, David. This covenant that God is making with David is connected with a name for David, with land for Israel, with shalom or peace for Israel, with a house for David. Verse 11, and, I, and it will be that when your days are fulfilled to go to be with your fathers, I will raise up one of your seed after you. It's a singular seed who will be of your sons and I will establish his kingdom. This is a good translation of what's happening here. Singular seed is in view. David, this covenant with David is connected with a seed, a descendant of David, and a kingdom to be established. Verse 12, he, singular, shall build for me a house, and I will establish his throne forever. I will be a father to him, and he will be a son to me. And I will not remove my loving kindness from him as I removed it from him who was before you. In reference to Saul. But I will cause him to stand in my house and in my kingdom forever. And his throne shall be established forever. God's kingdom, the my kingdom in verse 14, would be his kingdom he would be on the throne. This seed of David would rule over God's kingdom. This is what is a part of the covenant of David. Just jump forward. David is just in awe of this promise that he has made. He grasped the weight of this promise, knows that he's unworthy, just note in verse 23, so now, O Yahweh, let the word that you have spoken concerning your slave and concerning his house endure, endure forever and do as you have spoken for this purpose, verse 24, that your name endure and be magnified forever by saying Yahweh of hosts is the God of Israel, even a God to Israel, and the house of David is your servant, is established before you. The establishment of David's house the fulfillment of God's word to David in the Davidic covenant that we just read is for the purpose of what, according to verse 24? It is the endurance of the magnification, the exaltation of God's name forever. The fulfillment of the Davidic covenant is doxological. The, the, the fulfillment of the covenant of David has to do with the exaltation, the doxology, the praise of God's name. So if God does not fulfill his promise to David, then it's reproach that falls on God's name. God's name, God's exaltation, hinges on the fulfillment of God's promises to David. And this is why in the writing of this book, of Chronicles, David 
and Judah and faithfulness play such a prominent role. The Davidic covenant and everything we just read is connected with a name for David, with land for Israel, with Israel's shalom, with David's seed, with a kingdom to David's descendant, and with blessing. This is how he ends his prayer. Verse 27, so now you have been pleased to bless the house of your slave, that is the family of David, that it may be forever before you. For you, O Yahweh, have blessed and it is blessed forever. Just think about the connections. If, you're, if you know your Old Testament well, a name, peace, a land, descendants, a specific descendant, kings will come from you, God told Abraham in Genesis 14. These are the same overlapping promises as what God promised Abraham. The Davidic covenant fulfilled will be the Abrahamic covenant fulfilled. So just like God's glory hinges on the Davidic covenant's fulfillment, it's attached to former covenants. Abraham's covenant fulfilled as well. The author is connecting all of these things together in Chronicles. Those who receive the law as well as the new revelation in Chronicles would have been able to easily put all of these things together. Which is why in the genealogies, they run from Adam all the way through Abraham, through Judah, through David, and on. They're all connected. So with all of these things in view, a start at Adam, a finish at the exile, David's prominence, and other faithful men of Judah in view, here is how I articulate why Chronicles sits in your Bible. Yahweh, the sovereign God of heaven who created the world and everything in it, will fulfill his ancient promises to Israel for his glory through David's seed. The faithful will see it. It's a mouthful. Even by the end of the book, you'll remember that pagan king is acknowledging that Yahweh is the God of all the earth. He is the God of heaven. By beginning with Adam and ending with that pagan king's acknowledgement that Yahweh is the God of heaven, we get that Yahweh, we understand Yahweh, the sovereign God of heaven who created the world and everything, you could say everyone, in it. That is who he is. Yahweh, the sovereign God of heaven, who created the world and everything in it, will fulfill his ancient promise, promises to Israel. This is the Abrahamic covenant, the Davidic covenant. You could include the Mosaic covenant. He will fulfill his ancient promises to Israel. And as we read in chapter 17, this is for his glory through David's seed. Through David's seed. Not any seed of Judah, David's seed. Yahweh, the sovereign God of heaven who created the world and everything in it, will fulfill his ancient promises to Israel for his glory through David's seed. If you're taking notes, semicolon, the faithful will see it. Saul died because of his unfaithfulness. But don't forget those faithful people. God blessed Jabez. He was counting on blessing from God for a portion in the land. Caleb got his portion in the land given to him. Aaron got his portion in the land given to him. David, similarly, everybody else who got land, they were believing the promises of God. They saw the day, in a sense. The faithful will see it. That's the point. What, what use do, does, does Chronicles have for us? Read every word of God's revelation. Every single word is important. 
Every single detail matters. So read every word. What's your plan for reading every word, whether that's a one-year plan, if you're in our building Wellspring Ministries, you're on a one-year plan. Whatever your plan is, get through it all, have a plan to make it through every word of God's revelation, and train yourself, secondly, to notice the details of what God revealed. It's all important. Don't sleep on the genealogies. Don't skip them. Don't sleep through them. Notice every detail of the words of what God revealed. And, and finally, cling to the same promises as the faithful saints of old. Cling to the same promises as the faithful saints of old. When you read in your Old Testament that God promised a man a great name, believe that. When you read in the Old Testament that God promised his people land that they never got, those don't go away. Those don't get reinterpreted. Those don't get redefined. Those don't get spiritualized. They stand. Believe that. Look forward to that day. Anticipate that day. And believe every other detail of every other promise. And finally, be faithful. Be full of faith as you believe those promises. And what does a faithful life look like? What does a faithful life manifest? It manifests obedience. Not because obedience earns you the reward, but obedience is the proof that you believe. That's why it's called faithfulness. Because faithfulness, obedience, is being full of faith. And so even for a New Testament audience like us receiving these divinely inspired words, this is great encouragement to us to submit ourselves, submit our lives to the Lord, walk in a way worthy of the calling to which you've been called. As you believe God and look forward to a coming day when all of his promises are gloriously fulfilled, when his king in the person of Jesus Christ reigns from Jerusalem in a rebuilt temple, he as high priest and king will reign from that place that he builds in that day. Let me just close, because I can't help but show you this passage. And I know we're going long here. Zechariah chapter 6. That day being anticipated here by this prophet. This ornate silver and gold crown is set on the head of the current high priest as a symbol in the prophecy that the king would one day be the priest. The one who wears the crown would also have the role of priest. And so Zechariah verse 6, performing all of this, says, verse 12, Then you will say to him, thus says Yahweh of hosts, Behold, a man whose name is Branch, he will branch out from where he is, and he will build the temple of Yahweh. Indeed, it is he who will build the temple of Yahweh, and he who will bear the splendor, and sit and rule on his throne. Thus he will be a priest on his throne, and the council of peace will be between the two offices, peace, priest, and king. Priest on a throne, the first and only time in Israel's history. We look forward to this day. Look forward to this day. Believe in this day and obey Christ. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for these words, even where you forced us to wrestle with your own revelation as a, a challenge to our apathetic hearts at times to go dig for your meaning in your words. I pray that you would encourage us to draw near to you, even in portions of scripture that are difficult for us to understand, hard for us to endure. I pray that you would just tether our hearts to these remarkable promises that even where there is a cloud that lays over your revelation, that we would have believing hearts and draw near to you, not losing what we know to be true and working hard to discover what you intend for us to see until you finally give us clarity. 
And I do pray that you would grant clarity every time that we pick up your word, that you would show us that these promises, your own faithfulness, your own love for your people to bring about this day for our good and for your glory, it still stands and we can faithfully believe you and walk in confident obedience to you, to everything that you've commanded until one day, Lord willing, we would see what you have promised fulfilled. We pray that you would come quickly, Lord Jesus. It's in your name that we pray. Amen.